The mid-90s saw the release of many blockbuster movies that focus on aliens invading or attacking planet Earth. Two particular ones were loved by fans of the sci-fi genre as they featured a great combination of comedy and drama. Of course, I'm talking about 1996, Independence Day, and Men in Black, which just came out a year later. Now, these were incredible years for Will Smith, who starred in both films. Just think about the magnitude of this. When you think about 90s films, these two come up and they starred the same person. And not just that, but even thinking about 2019, these are movies that are quotable, that are memeable. When you think about, damn, you immediately go to Men in Black and think about that. So how great are these movies? What do we think about them? And above everything, what do we think about the interaction between Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones? That contrast, we're going to be talking about that right here, right now, on another exciting episode of A Cast to the Past. You can check out a brand new episode each and every Sunday where we talk about the 90s, the 2000s, the movies that we love, that we hate. We've talked about See No Evil, but luckily, we're done with that. We're talking about good stuff now because my name is Juan Velas. I am from Puerto Rico and joining me as always from Boston, Massachusetts, we have Ryan McNulty. Now, Ryan, when when you think about Will Smith, what is your favorite movie or TV show involving him? So I was looking at Will Smith's IMDb and I realized that there's a lot of movies of him that I have not seen. Um, but of the ones that I have seen, I would probably say Men in Black's my favorite movie. And then when it comes to TV, I mean, the only show I really know that he participated in was Fresh Prince, which I did enjoy growing up. I'm not as dedicated a fan as maybe you want, but I did enjoy the show growing up. Yeah, I've watched Fresh Prince every season, maybe like five or six times. I can quote the thing. It's just so damn good. But from London, Ontario, we have Keith Poshik and Keith, in your case, which of these two films do you prefer? Independence Day, which is more of the traditional thing, or is it, oh my good, Keith, t- tell me you've watched Independence Day. No. What? <laughs> what? I've never seen Independence Day, so I guess it's Men in Black by default. It's such a memorable movie that I automatically assumed you had watched it. Uh, well, why not? I don't know. Just never... Uh... Never came across my table, I guess. It's just something I never sat down and watched. I know it's great. I know it's memorable. I know it's a classic. God, I've seen that scene of the UFO blowing up the White House at least 10,000 times in my lifetime. But I've just never sat down and watched the movie. Instead, I played video games, I guess. And that one's on me. But no, never watched Independence Day. Wow. So that's something we eventually got to get to. It doesn't exactly <laughs> hit the same yeah. marks as... That's uh, true. That's true. That is that is very true, though. But with this episode, even though we've talked about some sci-fi theme stuff, I mean, the Mario movie does have some weird elements and things like that. Where do you yes, guys stand? the sci-fi classic. The yeah, Super course, Mario man. Brothers. <laughs> hey, it's got, it's got aliens, man. It's got aliens. But no, it's got dinosaurs. Get it right. Exactly. That, that is a thing as well. But where do you guys stand? Do you prefer more real-oriented movies like gangsters, uh, movies based on real-life events? Or do you like something like this? It's you know talking about space and maybe time traveling. I know, Keith, you're a big fan of Star Wars. But in your case, Ryan, which type of movie do you prefer? generally speaking honestly when it when it comes to it it's really about the characters for me i can be absorbed in any type of situation or reality or universe that you want to build because i love you know things like star wars and dragon ball z are very fantasy driven but then just your normal dramas and movies uh it's all about characters for me so even if it gets a little crazy and weird If it's grounded with likable characters, I can generally get into it. Yeah, I kind of lean more towards on the sci-fi side of things, I guess, or the fantasy side of things, because if I'm going to watch a movie and I kind of want to be taken away from real life for a minute where I don't want to think about if I basically if I want to watch something about gangsters or people shooting other people, I'll just watch the news instead. And I just dropped water (laughs) everywhere. That's no good. I should probably go take care of that. I'll be right back. (laughs) So as Keith, (laughs) holy crap, that was really hard, but we're going to keep going, Ryan. Meanwhile, so, I I was thinking about the fact that there's a lot of alien movies out there. You know, obviously you can talk about Alien, Alien versus Predator. 
What do you think in your case made it so fascinating in the mid 90s? Because we can add Mars attacks to this mix of just there was this obsession. I feel like the the early 2000s were all about zombies, but aliens were in the 90s. In your case, why why do you think that's the case? I'm I'm not necessarily sure what set it off, but I mean, if we look at things, movies just really seem to follow trends, right? When Avatar came out in what, like 2008 or around then, um, then all of a sudden there was a boom in 3D movies and everything has to be in 3D because everyone saw how much money Avatar made. So I think we just kind of move in waves, right? So there's always going to be those disaster type movies. So once aliens were kind of burnt out, like you said, we had this kind of zombie boom for sort of the mid to late 2000s. And then things kind of, it just kind of moves and uh, we're always kind of going to the next thing once, once they drive something into the ground, you know, we just move to the next phase. Keith, is uh, your monitor okay? Did you break anything? We're good. No, just had to clean up some water. We're, uh, we're all good. There's worse things to spill, I guess, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Exactly. Like my feelings. <laughs> but that, that's always going to be the case. But Keith, uh, what about you for, for alien movies? Is that just something you particularly like? You know, mentioned Alien, Alien vs. Predator. There's a ton of examples out there. But within the sci-fi genre, as somebody that, once again, you love Star Wars, do you like other stuff outside of just that? or? It really all, I don't really have a preference as far as like type of fantasy. It's more about if it's a good story for me, if it's a universe that I can really be uh, encapsulated in and escape to, if they do good world building, that's what really does it for me. Because if it's an alien movie and the aliens don't look good or they just look like costumes, it's impossible for me to get into, even though uh star wars is one of my favorite movies there are times where and there are very bad scenes in star wars that encapsulate exactly that but it really again it it kind of comes down to what uh what kind of movie i'm in the mood for because if uh if i'm looking for a horror movie like a horror fantasy movie alien the movie alien is the best at uh doing that i'm not really going to find something in like a medieval fantasy uh style there but if i want to see just cool things like dragons and big wars and stuff i'm probably going to find more of that in the fantasy area so it really all depends what i'm in the mood for you mentioned something that it is very specific in this genre which is the graphical component because when you think about a drama movie, there's not a lot of CGI or animation that needs to happen. But with something like this, even before the the story, I feel like people's expectation is, how is this going to look? Like when you think about aliens interacting with human beings, you know, we talked about Toy Story, like the first one, and the fact that graphically, it even though it gets the job done, obviously it doesn't hold up as well as the other ones. But with this movie, when we first selected it, I was, I was concerned because I'm like, hey, man... This is mid-90s, like, how is this going to look? And I got to say, I saw it on Blu-ray, and uh, this holds up surprisingly well. I think there's a lot of animatronics. For the most part, I think everything outside of the costume design and the alien design doesn't really hold up that well, but... You could take those aliens that were in this movie and put them in a movie today and they would they would fit. They would fit perfectly. It was just so ahead of its time. I felt Ryan. a little bit differently about the CGI and that might have been the TV I was watching it on. Uh, I wasn't in my normal setting. of It wasn't my house that I was watching this in. And the TV had kind of you know that like soap opera effect that you can have on some oh TVs? yeah hell no I yeah hate so that. so that was going on and that might have played a role in why the cgi looked worse because i feel in general it does make special effects look worse but it definitely looked not horrible um but i think like the mikey alien at the beginning in particular looked like probably the worst he was the um, weakest one yeah yeah and and the bug at the end was very like 90s cg looking other than that the other effects like the guy's head blowing off and regrowing i thought looked fine um but those in particular and some of the like the the when they're shooting at the ufo and stuff it looked a little not so great but i mean for its time definitely top tier 
Yeah, if you think about it, it makes sense that the weakest ones are the ones where they're sort of outside and there's a lot more going on because the other ones, when they're in the Men in Black base, they have a lot more control, right? Like the, the camera is centered around the aliens, therefore they can uh, blend in a little bit more. But just to give everybody some context, so this movie came out in July 1997, and critically speaking, people loved it. I mean, when you go over to Rotten Tomatoes, uh, the customer, uh, the uh, casual viewer reviews are very positive. It's got a 92% positive rating, so certified fresh. Now, the second movie came out in 2002, so there's a major gap between the first one and the second one. However, review-wise, it did not do uh, nearly as good at 39%. Then the third movie came out in 2012, so an entire decade after that one did a little bit better. That one starred Josh Brolin. So we've talked about Endgame and other stuff. Now here's Josh Brolin involved in the mix. They went back in time. Insert. That was that was Florida, right? Uh, Pitbull. Oh, Pitbull. So they're, they're they're the same category. Yeah, and they're, then, they're basically the same person. Yeah, but then in on June fourteenth, two thousand nineteen. We're going to be getting the fourth movie starring uh, Chris Hemsworth and Tessa uh, Thompson. I, I hopefully said that name right. Two people of the Thor Marvel Universe. <laughs> That's interesting, right? Although it makes sense. The fact that they're just different agents. So you could easily spawn 50 different movies and each one could have a completely different cast. But generally speaking, kicking it off first with Ryan, what did you think about this movie when it first came out and then having watched it now? Did you have fun watching it? So I was about eight years old when this first came out and I absolutely loved this movie. When I when I was eight, Will Smith was the funniest man alive. Yeah, and I, I saw this out. movie and I like every single joke landed with me at then. Now watching it, I don't think Will Smith was really that funny at all. Maybe because I was already ready for the jokes that were to come. I, even though it's been a, a very, very long time since I've seen this movie, I still kind of knew where the jokes were going to be. And none of it really landed for me. I didn't think it was very funny at all. I thought this movie just going back was just okay. It didn't really grip me in the same way as a kid. It just didn't hold up in the same way. I don't think it was bad, but I wasn't like, oh, yeah, this is as great as I remember it. I, I, I definitely felt it wasn't as strong. I'm trying to remember when the first time I saw this movie was. It's weird. I have memories around this movie, but I don't remember watching this movie for the first time. I know I've seen it. I saw it on VHS at some point because that's one of the memories I have around it. And I remember liking it, uh, especially the alien, uh, the aliens back then. I loved them. And that's really the part of the movie that I still enjoy. I would I would agree with Ryan in saying that it's all right going back to where it's kind of two conversations where I still think they knocked the costuming and the alien design out of the park. Everything else around it kind of felt like a mediocre action movie, a popcorn flick, where it was trying to be a popcorn flick, and it succeeded in that, but in no way else as far as uh, scenes and characters and all that uh, sort of stuff goes. And to the Will Smith point, it going back to it, it just kind of felt like a Will Smith movie. Yes, the jokes you could see coming, but that was kind of every Will Smith movie at that time. You could probably take half the lines in this movie and put them in any other mid-90s, late-90s Will Smith movie, like a Wild Wild West, and it would fit perfectly in that movie. Okay, you, you can bring up many different movies. Wild Wild West is not one I would bring up in, in this conversation, because it's Why not? terrible. It's close enough. It's pretty. It's close enough in time, but it's a bad movie. Men in Black and Wild Wild West are closer to the same movie than I bet you are willing to admit. No, it's a... I, I saw Wild Wild West last year. No, <laughs> at all. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch it. I was thinking about it. that. Yeah, but um, for me, I think that when you watch this movie, you really got to think about not just the context, but the importance of this. It came out an entire year after Independence Day which that movie was one of the biggest movie releases of the 90s, dare I say, all time. It was the definition of a blockbuster movie. I think that when you say blockbuster, you think about this mainstream movie 
that can appeal to a wide audience. It's going to have your drama. It's going to have your comedy. It's going to have your action. It's the most family-friendly movie, right? That gives you, it, it checks off all the marks that you would expect from a movie. So you have Will Smith in that and you put him in, in this one. So right off the bat, you know it's going to work. Plus then on the flip side, you have Tommy Lee Jones. I mean, his movie repertoire is amazing. And he was somebody that in the 80s and 90s, you would see him in pretty much everything. And it's this dynamic that you have like this goofy comedy character, but then the really serious guy on the flip side. For me, I think this movie is the definition of a good time. Like when you say good time, I'm not saying best movie ever. I'm not saying it's a movie that had me laughing every single second because it wasn't, but I felt like the ride was long enough that it never overstayed its welcome, and it gives you a really good idea that, yeah, CGI could be pretty good in, in the 90s. I mean, most of it was animatronic, so it's like, you know, uh, uh, people were actually dressing up in the alien costume. Some of them were robots, so that's why some of them, you know, lasted uh, or look a little bit better com compared to others, but... It did not feel like a movie that felt outdated. Like maybe the CGI could stand to improve, but unlike The Matrix where you see a phone and it's like, oh, this this is definitely like a movie of its era. I feel like this one did a much better job of hiding the 90s-ness and, and it can sort of just stand on its own in, in this year. Like technolo technologically speaking, you know, you got the, the weapons, you got stuff like that. Is there anything for you guys that sort of looked 90s outdated in a bad way? Not, Not really. at all. Because yeah. they uh, they went out of their way to create their own lore, I guess, their own fiction, where it's very rare in that movie where they use like a real life gun or any of the stuff that they use, we would find anywhere in the real world. It's all like imaginary guns and quote unquote like alien blasters and that kind of stuff so by creating their own stuff they don't have to worry about being outdated because the problem with the matrix like you mentioned was the fact that it relied so much on technology where at that time was cutting edge or normal and society moved on society hasn't caught up with quote unquote alien blasters yet or plasma pistols that we so, know of that we know of, that's true. Maybe somewhere a Men in Black organization is going like, oh, remember when they used that in the 90s? But to yeah. our knowledge, we haven't gotten there yet. So then, generally speaking, the plot of this movie, um, and I, I got to sort of tease one of the, the facts at the very end. This movie was very different when it was first edited. There's an entire plot that was taken out, and the the closing scene of the movie was actually reshot. So one thing huh. was what the movie was originally supposed to be, and then the other was what we ended up getting, which is, you know, somewhat of an alien invasion movie. Although you can definitely see, like, they didn't prioritize. For, for a movie that's about aliens possibly going to destroy planet Earth, I feel like they really did not play to that, because... Nobody really knows what's going on. And I know even a K, Tommy Lee Jones' character, says, like, our job is to make sure that people don't know this is happening all the time. So that's almost like their way of justifying that. But I do feel like that could have been tightened up a little bit, or maybe they could have played into that so it mattered more. But it's a comedy movie. What did you guys think of the basic plot that led to all the things happening? Yeah, it, it's similar to The Matrix in that they have a lot to pack in, right? Where uh, Will Smith is essentially like the Neo type of character where he's coming into this world and he has to learn about everything that's going on. But then at the same time, you have to establish another threat. And it just seems a little random that the the bug guy who's landing here, like, oh, yeah, he wants to destroy the world. You don't really know much about his motive motivation and why and you don't really feel that external threat kind of like you said because n the regular human population isn't really knowing what's going on so it's really only the the men in black that are like oh my god the world's gonna blow up we gotta do something it is a lot to pack in but i do feel like they do a pretty good job uh, of balancing that the best they could do we ever really find out what the bug's motivation is, or is it just... I think I you just, just literally destroy the world. No. Keith. Okay. Planet Earth, man. You, you gotta blow it up. Welcome to that's, Earth. I know that's, that's, true. that's Independence Day, but... 
<laughs> right. Hey, and you, I haven't seen it, it, so I don't uh, I don't understand <laughs> right. that concept oh, I yet. I already forgot that, but <laughs> oh, but the I, I'm still uh, not over that. The broad strokes of the plot, I think, are kind of whatever. Uh, you kind of that's not what this movie is about. It's turn your brain off for a fun time. But the little details of the movie, I think that's where it excels, where they take something like Weekly World News or those tabloid magazines that everybody kind of laughs and like, oh, that's I none of that's that, real. Yeah. And they turned it into, well, that's actually where the real stuff is happening. Those were the successes of the movie from a story perspective. As far that was as one I of the best concerned. like little tidbits that the movie added was like something you could relate to like oh you everyone always left that tabloids but to the men in black that's that's their main newspaper uh that that was pretty cool it was and even that is something that in 2019 if if like a kid is watching this movie now it's still relevant because if you live in somewhere like new york where you see these newspaper stands that's still out there right so it, it almost makes you look at the the cover and be like huh I wonder I wonder if that is real. We always talk about the aliens and the things that are happening. But with the movie, we have uh, the Men in Black, which is the, the organization that tries their best to hide the real things that are happening from the public eye. And they do that by uh, erasing memories with a thing that they have so they can erase particular moments so that way people just get to live a pretty relaxing life. So all things considered... MIB is pretty good. Their job is to make us sleep sound, sleep better. But uh, the the teammate of K, played by Tommy Lee Jones, once again, the teammate retires, and then K is on the lookout for the next replacement, to, for, for the next person to join the MIB. So here we have uh, Will Smith, who's a cop. He's very agile. He was uh, in pursuit of an alien. He didn't even know it was an alien, but, I mean, when a guy dump, jumps on top of a building... You just start asking questions, right? So fast forward, he sees that. And then Will Smith, and this is maybe my favorite part of the movie. And it is like the most simple thing ever. He actually gets a, a test taken. He's got to take some tests to figure out, you know, if he's worthy of becoming an MIB. So everybody sits in these pods. They're taking this test, but the paper is flimsy. The pencils break. So he actually pulls the table, causing this outrageous sound. But he's the only one, right, that actually figures out there's a table, nobody's using it. What did you think about the scene where you have all these military, Navy, Army personnel, and then there's Will Smith in super laid back outfit and just exceeding or, or definitely being Will Smith doing Will Smith things? I loved the scene and was kind of half expecting the actual test to be, oh, you're the person that grabbed the table when they didn't go that route, which is fine. But I loved that little dynamic of it. Uh, it really built Will Smith up as this person that goes against the grain and maybe has a bit of an attitude problem that ends up being perfect for MIB. I yeah, I enjoyed it. I again, this was something I it's it's one of the more memorable scenes. So, was it as funny the second time around? No, but I I do appreciate this scene cuz everyone can relate to those situations where they had to write something down and there wasn't really a good spot to do so. So you're writing on your knee and it's really awkward and uncomfortable. So I thought that was well done. One thing I did want to say jumping back just a bit was that opening scene with Will Smith I thought the the costume choice was a little weird. Like he's wearing these like orange... Will Smith's apparel. Yeah, like he's yeah, wearing these was orange weird. baggy pants and this white shirt, and it looks even though he, they clearly state he's like NYPD pretty early on. He it almost looks like he's like a prisoner or someone escaping because he's got these bright orange pants. That maybe he's that wearing. was the thing in the nineties, man. Maybe that's the one thing that's out there. Yeah. It yeah, looks I mean, like he just finished filming The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, walked over and filmed that scene without changing costume. Yeah, fortunately for Men in Black, they're saved by their normal attire being traditional suits, so it doesn't look outdated from then on. Yeah, now, when talking about that, from the suit to the personality, you know, most of the Men in Black people are just super, you know, one-dimensional, monotone, but then... That's the fun in it, right? Then you add Will Smith to the mix. And on Twitter and stuff like that, you'll still see GIFs of like the following scenes. Like, I make this look good. Or when he goes like, damn, and little things like that. And you almost forget 
Like this was mid nineties. And even to this day, people still bring this up. So it lets you know that, you know, whether it's Will Smith playing Will Smith, right? So naturally you're going to be entertained. You know what he's going to do, but I, I couldn't see anybody else playing this role, right? Do you think that, did the movie makes Will, Will Smith or vice versa? I think, I guess it's a good question to consider here. I would say Will Smith definitely makes this movie. He brings the personality to it. And if you didn't have him, you would need someone else with a very strong personality to really carry this film. Because Tommy Lee Jones, as we said, he's really playing the straight-laced guy who's in the organization. He's definitely got some sense of humor to him, but it, it wouldn't be enough. You, you needed someone with, with like Will Smith's type of personality to really carry the movie see i partly disagree with that because i think the dynamic of will smith and tommy lee jones is what makes the movie like you can't have just one of them in the movie you need both of them together to really sell it you need will smith to be will smith and be the witty kind of funny guy and then tommy lee jones to play the straight laced oh okay yeah you think this is bad but i've seen this 50 times over without both of them i don't think it would have worked as well as it did so wouldn't give all the credit to will smith something that i did like about this movie uh, rush hour one of my favorite trilogies of all time especially like the first two movies but with that one Jackie Chan was definitely the smarter, more agile guy. And then Chris Tucker was the dumb idiot. He had personality, but he was dumb. But in this movie, Will Smith has the personality, but he's pretty smart. Like, he picks up everything. Like, at no point during the movie that I feel like he's purposely messing up. Like, he's he's getting adjusted, right? But it's not because he's an idiot. Like, they, they show right at the beginning of the movie, he's agile, you know, he's fast. He, he's smart, all things considered. Even that table scene lets you know he's willing to think outside of the box. So I like the fact that they didn't go to the to the full extreme of, well, he's the one with the personality, so his IQ is going to be that of a raisin. They actually did a fairly good job of having each character be almost equal, but then the personalities come in, and that's how things sort of change. Because uh, the, the next part that I want to switch to is the action scenes where I think that even though there's not a ton of them, there is some action. And even there, you get to see the differences of what happens when Tommy Lee Jones has a huge gun. You know, Kay has the huge guns, and then Jay's got the little tiny gun, but he unleashes a lot of hell. Uh, What did you think about the action uh, scenes as a whole? I was surprised how few there were, I would say, and maybe that's the big difference between if you released Men in Black 1 today there would be probably way more action scenes and longer action scenes. And this one, I don't think it necessarily needs it, just how we kind of look at these types of movies today versus in the 90s. Um, But yeah, it was more just a surprising lack of action scenes, really. It's true. There weren't that many action scenes, but I do think it's to the benefit of this movie because... Maybe this is just me, but when we finally got to the action, when we got to the climax of the movie against the bug, in my opinion, that was one of the weakest parts of the movie. That's where I kind of felt like, okay, this is getting a little lame. So maybe it's the fact that I prefer the world building of it all, but I wasn't, I didn't mind the fact that there wasn't that much action. What would you say was the weakest part of the movie for you, Keith? Probably the bug part the end uh, the ending there where they go up against the bug and it's getting to that point of uh getting to the point of will smith crushing the bugs and figuring it all out and ended up uh, killing him i would say either that part or the baby alien part because it kind of felt out of place (laughs) really yeah i wasn't i wasn't a big it was funny it was good but it felt like a weird uh a weird like going off the road for a bit just to go back on it it was a weird diversion that i wasn't that big of a fan of what about you ryan something that was maybe at the bottom of the barrel probably the those two other aliens that get killed uh, you know the guy with the baby alien in his head like where they're sitting down to dinner and you're I I don't know. I didn't under you didn't really understand the full significance of that jewel and why it mattered. So kind of any of their scenes in that subplot, you almost didn't even really need it because 
Like, uh, I get, I guess we can kind of circle back to what was uh, Edgar the Bug Dude's motivation. He wanted that, uh, that galaxy thing. That's what he really wanted. But somehow he was also going to destroy the Earth, even if whether he got it or not. Um, yeah. So I got to bring this up that, now that's because that's kind of weak. Uh, th- there is a reason why a lot of these scenes don't make up, don't don't make a lot of sense, and it's because they actually removed a part of the movie. So I'm just going to read one of the uh, facts here because it is interesting. I think this would add a lot more to the movie, but maybe it would lessen the comedy. So an entire subplot of the movie was removed in post-production, according to ScreenRant.com. And that reads, um, there were going to be two different alien races, which put the Earth in jeopardy. And that was reshaped during the post-production process. Needless to say, excising a chunk of the story necessitated man, that is a big word, necessitated some creative maneuvering in order to make the Arkeland's Earth, uh, the Arkeland Earth's primary threat, I guess that is the name of one of the aliens. That's the people that were on the countdown that had the ship. Yeah, exactly. Uh, A few subtle alterations had to be made to fill the holes where the no longer existing references to the Baltians once were. So there's an entire alien race in the movie that was removed, which actually makes a lot of sense because you mentioned that scene of two people sitting in the restaurant. So here's this king-like character that we haven't seen aside from, you know, a couple of seconds with his cat in his store. He goes to eat. He dies. Literally, that's it, right? There's no other big thing but if you had mentioned this, then it would make maybe make a lot more sense. So he's like maybe the the Balthians one or the Baltian one. He gets killed, and then the others try to invade Earth and destroy it. Actually, makes sense. Would that have changed maybe the the logic of the movie for you, or made it better? It's kind of tough to say, really, just because we don't know how in depth that plot really was. It could have been something that uh, ended up making the movie more convoluted than it needed to be, and that's why it got left on the cutting room floor. So I'm I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, I don't I don't know if it would make it any better. I think for the most part, they did a pretty damn good job considering that they removed an entire plot line from the movie, yeah. and it's not it's it's barely noticeable so that you know good on them you're just kind of like why should i care about these guys but it's not it's not too distracting that it ruins the movie but i gotta agree with you i think that that was maybe the the weakest part of the movie because to me it's like unless you're dead you're gonna dedicate time to something just remove it like you could have easily added some more context like hey you know we we saw that he has a wife that he was supposed to mysteriously disappear because obviously when you join the men in black, one of the things that happens is they remove your identity. So that's why, you know, we have K and J. It's just you're down to one uh, singular letter as as part of your name. So maybe they could have added some stuff like that as to why is K so serious or why is J so funny and little things like that. But uh, d- despite that, I think that they did a pretty solid, good, solid thing. Like my favorite. I disagree part of- with that, though. Sorry to uh, yeah. to go here for a bit, but I think they do a really good job about building up, like why uh, K is so serious, just because of the the going back to constant, like, oh yeah, I've seen this before, kid. Or if you think this is this is bad, you should have been around for whatever that event was in '63, and that one scene of him just basically spying on his old wife is all that you really need to um to really develop no way his she would have waited for him <laughs> yeah, she would have yeah. moved on it's yeah a hundred percent but still a little bit of movie magic there i don't think they needed to put any more character development in that movie than they already had in it i'm very curious how they so we all know and the most probably the most iconic thing that everyone talks about with men in black is that my the memory eraser thing now if you're going to erase somebody's like identity, do they take? The, do they literally have to figure out every person they've ever known of significance, the, and they erase all their memories or whatever? I mean, I guess for K, they said he was like in a coma or something, so maybe yeah. they just I imagine do that. They're just considered dead. <clears throat> That's what I thought yeah, in my yeah. head, and that was good enough for me. I just think it's uh, it's a little weird how. They had, at the very beginning of the movie, Kay's uh, partner is retiring. And then at the end of this movie, Kay's the one that's retiring. So it's just, 
man, yeah, you, you he's like, got a little bit I, I less. I was finding I, my own replacement. It's like, like hell you were. That other guy retired. You got two spots to fill. Yeah. <laughs> It's just too much, like like I mentioned, and, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that a couple of different tweaks could have made this movie go from from great to maybe one of the best of all time, even though, once again, 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. So even critically speaking, this type of movie doesn't tend to do well. Like, let's not forget critics with this genre, with these actors, with this combination. Are they actually getting reviews from that time? Because Rotten Tomatoes is always a little finicky with older movies before it existed. Yeah, there, there's and enough. And some of that from... could be nostalgia, you know? So Yeah, it, it could possibly be. So that's maybe something to consider. But regardless, I feel like uh, it's a very solid movie. What would you say then on the flip side, starting with Keith, was your favorite thing about it? My favorite thing about it, um, with the exception of just saying the alien costuming in general, was the buildup of the Men in Black and every scene in the Men in Black headquarters. Just how it was this weird alien flight terminal that all the aliens had to go through. And you have all these different species and they don't spend all this time building this backstory. And it's just normal that everything uh, everything's there. I really enjoyed the world build of all of that and the lengths that they go to without shoving it down your throat basically of uh this world that just seems normal to everybody else but is so crazy if you really stop and think about it just all of that and the time that they took even though it is an action movie to build this weird crazy out of this world world that uh, that all seemed to make perfect sense while being completely illogical at the same time that's that's my favorite part of it what about you i would actually agree with keith that the men in black are actually themselves way more interesting than really any of the aliens that they show i i want to learn more about them and what they do so when they're exploring that those are always the more interesting parts to me one thing i liked is the whole aspect that aliens are living with us you know, you think back to a weird example, but like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and things like that, right? Where the turtles are living among human beings, but here, you don't know who's an alien and who's not. So there's one part of the movie where Jay's uh, saying, oh, I think this teacher was an alien. And then Kay actually responds, yeah, she's from this specific planet, takes the <laughs> clip there. So I love the fact that they embrace, like, um, usually aliens are, are seen as like this serious threat that we don't understand. But this movie quickly establishes like, no, aliens are actually not bad. Like we have some bad aliens, but the fact that you have the bad and the good, even going back to when uh, Jay was first recruited, you know, you have the aliens just grabbing coffee. I feel like something that really goes under the radar with this movie is the great job that they do at establishing good aliens before the bad ones, because yeah, you have the bug one and you have all of that, but even uh, T- Tony Sh- Shalou from from Monk, like I didn't even know that was him, just because the prosthetics in his face, it, it doesn't even look like him. But he's got a store, but then he's got alien-like weapons that he's selling on the side. So it's like, who do I know in my life, you know, that maybe has a second life or or is an alien and little things like that? I have one question for you guys, though. We're talking about the MIB. And, and the possibilities of becoming agents. The fact that your, your entire life has to be erased, like, uh, is that something that if you knew this was true, aliens are actually part of the real world, and Keith, you're incredibly athletic, we're, we're just assuming, it's sci-fi, it's fantasy, okay? Yeah, so that is fantasy. So you're incredibly athletic, <laughs> and they offer your spot to be the replacement of K, because, I mean, Keith, would you take it knowing that you gotta disappear? Oh, yeah. No doubt. No question. Not only would it be cool to see aliens, but I'm totally okay with disappearing. I mean, it's what I want to do most days anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Ryan, do you want to disappear? No, not really. I don't really want to be an alien cop. It as much as it could be a, a great story benefits. and adventurous free coffee what are the benefits i don't know i haven't seen you know what's the health insurance what's the salary what can i even do with that money who cares you're an alien cop the good thing is with the retire pl- uh, re- retirement plan you don't live any trauma because they just boop they erase that dude so you magically just age 
You become like you magically just age, and older. you wonder what the hell happened for the last twenty five years of my life. Like it's just missing from your life. So Ooh. I don't know. You know, Th- is this, that good? Is that really that good? This brings up a question. So the one thing that they do a lot in this movie is like they'll they'll make up some BS. You know, when they erase the memory, they'll just say like, "Hey, the person left you. You never deserved them." If somebody were to erase your memory and they could just fill your head with whatever. Is there a hypothetical scenario that you would like to hear people say? Could you just this think about a, the fact that they can make anything up? This is a deep question. This is a question I don't know if question. I'm ready to ask myself. <laughs> yeah, I forget how they handle, because Men in Black 2, they obviously bring K back. I forget how they handle that, because they erased his memory. Does yeah. he just magically remember everything from the old movies, or do they I have don't to think re- so. Yeah, I, I totally forget what they I believe they have did. to re-bring him back into the fold and try and jog his memory. Because at the end of this movie, they uh, explain it as he's been in a coma for the last 25 years. But I'm, if I'm remembering the sequel correctly, it's they find him because he has some information, and they have to jog his memory because it's been erased and try to get him to remember, and eventually he does. Okay, good good to know, because I honestly forgot. The third one, I don't think we'll ever talk about it in the near future, but I think the third one was actually really good, how they did go back in time, and then you have Josh Brolin, who I think does an excellent Tommy Lee Jones impression. Josh Brolin, dude. I need to watch... Everybody listening and watching, please go to Twitter right now and just recommend the best Josh Brolin movie you can think of, because I feel like that man uh, deserves a little bit more recognition. What is what is something about this movie that you think is memorable or that you think when you think of the 90s, this just brings up something great from those movies that it's quotable, it's a uh, jiffable, it's unforgettable. All right. Follow me on this one. Here uh-huh. come the men in black. They're going to save, save the, the universe. <laughs> That's the most memorable thing from this entire movie. And it's not even till the credits. That is true. Yeah, that that was a huge thing in the '90s. Was you needed a Will song Smith rapping to go with your movie? Yeah, <laughs> no, you Will needed Smith. a Will Smith song to go <laughs> yeah, with your exactly. movie. Exactly. Yeah, pretty much. Not one for Independence Day though. But you got Wild Wild West. You got the Men in Black song. There was a Wild Wild West song. Wild yeah, no, Wild, Wild, Wild for West. Independence Day. Oh, for said, Independence yeah. Day. Sorry. That Still haven't been seen a, that movie. It wouldn't, wouldn't really know. fit. No, no, that wouldn't have been great. So then let's talk about the bug alien for a minute because we haven't really touched up on that. And I feel like uh, he's he's the same actor from Law and Order, SVU, right? Yeah. No. Which is crazy. It's not. It's criminal intent, I think it criminal, is. Criminal. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm an SVU I person I love myself. my Law and Order. I love yeah. all the Law Edgar, and Orders. Where's Edgar's Oscar? That's what I want to know. He was the right? best actor in this movie. That is very true. That is... Man... That's one thing with this movie that even though people don't get a lot of lines, you establish a lot of characters that you can envision a Men in Black world. You have the pug, for example, right? The pug that can talk. And most of these characters, like, think about the fact that this movie came out in 97, the next one came out in 2002. So there's a good chance that there was never going to be a sequel. So think about these characters that were clearly established to maybe show up for five minutes how 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 important were they for you even though in the grand scheme of things they were only on screen for a couple of seconds did they increase your enjoyment maybe they didn't make you laugh but they made you feel like this is a standalone world that they created this is i mean they made made them memorable in the short screen time that they had like like the pug and i love pugs so i I have a (laughs) I was, even though he was clearly abusing that animal, and I hope that <laughs> that was done safely when he actually had a real pug in his hands. Um, yeah, they're very memorable, and it it helps with the animated series that a lot of those characters had more to do when they when that show came out. True, because you know you had the coffee aliens. Yeah, ha- I believe the pug was also in the in the yep. cartoon and and a, and those guys at the computers. So a lot of those guys you still got to see. And speak of songs, the Men in Black cartoon that intro song was also badass with the um, I animation how it and sounds. stuff. Listen I don't to remember it again. how it sounds. All right, I listen to it after this podcast. It, it's way better than you remember. All right, I will do so. 
and to the to the development i think it's to its benefit to that all of these characters don't show up for more than their like stay more than they're welcome because it really goes to help build this already established world that you're just kind of taking a look into because to the people that see frank the pug every day it's just frank the pug it's you and will smith's character that's seeing them for the first time and then uh, going back to the Buck character, one thing I applaud them for doing, and it wasn't really obvious to me till like almost the very end. So he first goes to planet Earth, right? Welcome to Earth. I was gotta say that now. And then he takes over, you know, this uh, this husband. The wife is like, "What the hell?" He asks for the water with the sugar. But he looks fairly clean at the beginning. Like he looks messed up, but he looks clean. I was but, gonna comment on the same thing. Yeah, same but go ahead. The fact that through throughout the film. He gets weirder, like the posture, like the skin tone towards the end and towards the end of the movie. He becomes nasty in the fact with the well, yeah, the body's like decomposing. His, the, yeah. his skin suit body yeah, he's is just actually dead at that point because you he? can see his f- yeah. Oh, I mean, the Edgar thing. He's always been dead, Edgar, because he literally just like eviscerated him completely and then went inside of his skin suit essentially but you could see towards the end like his fingers have gotten like blue and stuff because the actual skin body part is yeah. like decomposing so that was very good detail and i don't know how much was special effects versus just him like making his neck all weird and acting but it was very convincing that it was he was playing somebody who wasn't in their own skin literally <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's not in the uh, the facts that I wrote down here, but apparently he did a little bit of method <laughs> acting, so he purposely worked did things that would limit his take movement. somebody else's skin. Is <laughs> yeah, that how he really <laughs> full blown <laughs> method acting? <laughs> he got an alien, came to planet Earth, got inside of his body, and did the movie. <laughs> Maybe I could have said it differently, but I already said it now. So <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> oh my god. The, the, the things that I say here, but do you think that this movie needed a sequel? We've had two, and we have a third I mean, sequel coming out, so, so we go, know that. If you go watch Men in Black 2, that answer is absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> what happened to the girl? Did the girl ever come back? It didn't seem like she was in the second I don't remember. I haven't seen the second one since 2002. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah, I Same remember here. nothing about it, yeah. So eventually, we're going to have to at least do a follow-up in and off the rails or something. Just one of us torture ourselves with the second one. Hey, guess what? It I'll was bad it then. It's still bad now. I, b- I bought the trilogy on Blu-ray. Like The best thing about doing this podcast now is we're sort of in that time. Like Remember when DVDs were sort of dying out? Like They're still out there, but they're seen as like the, the third option now. When DVDs were dying out, you could buy like the trilogy of a movie that would usually cost like twenty bucks a piece. You can get it for nothing. So I got the first three Men in Black movies on Blu-ray for like thirteen bucks. I got uh, like all of the Die Hard movies for twenty. So if there's ever been a really good time to just sort of catch up on movies that maybe growing up you did not experience, I really think it is right now. So for everybody listening and watching, uh, you know, I asked a thing earlier, but now it's like. Which is like the best trilogy that you hear a lot of people don't bring up. Even Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is becoming a trilogy that I ask people, have you watched it? And they'll be like, which which movie? Because like, there's a lot of I young need to people re-watch that haven't it. watched it. Mm-hmm. It's been a I while since I've too. seen Lord of the Rings. Bit of Keith. a resurgence with Lord of the Rings recently when it yeah. comes to giant fantasy genres that nailed it. Yeah, that actually stick the landing. Yeah, oh, oh boy. See, uh, I'm, I'm out of the loop, but I understand just enough to get it. Plus, we had that Tolkien movie uh, come out very soon. And uh, what would you say is the legacy of this Men in Black movie, considering the fact that it's not the first Alien movie, it's not the first Alien movie focused in the comedy genre, but it, it did come out like, think about Will Smith in 1995, he had Bad Boys 1. And then Independence Day the year after, and this one the year after. And then like two, three years later, he got Wow Wow West, so the combo broke there. But mid-90s, what is the legacy of Men in Black? You might need to correct me on this one in case this point counts for Independence Day. Because again, haven't seen that movie, but in my opinion, the... 
legacy of Men in Black is being able to do comedy in an alien movie without making the aliens look overly comical. Because when you look at the other alien movies of that time, like the one, the example that sticks out to me is Mars Attacks, how that's an alien comedy, but it's all very, uh, the aliens Ridiculed, look, yeah. yeah, it's all ridicule and the aliens look like their characters a inside style. of a comedy. Exactly, exactly. And this took the idea of aliens and instead of making them look comical it's their actions and it's the world around him or around them that create the comedy instead where you don't have to make them look low budget and stupid for lack of a better word uh, lack of a better word and it's more about the dialogue in that respect and turning that into an action movie Ryan, before you go on i think keith brought up something we didn't consider so Independence Day and this movie have a comedy character in Will Smith and the way that he behaves, even though he's a hero in both, but they're dramatically different aliens. So the aliens in Independence Day, they're straight up aliens, like think of the most basic aliens. You barely even see them. Like you really don't, it's more about the spaceships and things like that. So it is interesting how you have in a year's difference, the same actor in a somewhat similar situation because of the the menace, right? But the 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 characters change even though they're still alien so interesting how you get to see both uh, sides of the spectrum there so good good note on that i yeah i i think the legacy of men in black is definitely part of the quintessential 90s blockbuster movies it's just a part of that echelon and it did really kick off a a franchise is it the strongest franchise in the world i would say not really but we did get plenty of toys uh an animated series and a they're still making movies to this day we got men in black international coming out in a couple weeks as of this recording so we got a couple of video games it, actually yeah video games as well it did enough things right wow. to I know there was continue a game. like men in black you know, you'll forget about it for several years, but then it always finds a way to pop back up. You can see just alone by the the spacings between sequels, you know, every five to ten years, all of a sudden, hey, there's Men in Black again. That is very, very true. So everybody, <clears throat> uh, please let us know what you think about this movie, because I, I get the feeling like if you're 20 years old right now, there's very little chance that you've watched this, because when you think about 90s movies... If I had to pick between Independence Day and this for which one you should watch, maybe I would go with Independence Day because it's 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 epic. I feel like if in the 90s you could pick one movie to have that word epic, it would have to be that for for the scale and the characters and the casting and, and little things like that. But uh, let us know, you know, if you've watched it and feel free to recommend any other alien inspired or or sci-fi movie that we should check out in the near future. But before we head off into the sunset, we actually have a couple of interesting facts. And this one, I feel like out of, out of all the movies that we've done this portion of the podcast for, it was hard to, to boil it down to four options. Because like I mentioned, the casting, even the ending was different. So take it away, Mr. McNulty. All right. So before we jump into the other couple facts you have here, I did want to point out something I only found out a couple of years ago is that the men in black are actually based off of like a real world conspiracy theory, I guess. Really? That, yeah, that, um, and this is according to Wikipedia, in popular culture and UFO conspiracy theories, men in black are supposed to be men dressed in black suits who claim to be quasi-government agents who harass or threaten UFO witnesses to keep them quiet about what they've seen. Huh. So there's there's people who have claimed to have these experiences after a UFO sighting where they run into these mysterious government agents that people say are almost like alien-like and have told them to keep quiet. I know even Dan Aykroyd from Gr Ghostbusters, apparently when he was filming some UFO show, had an experience he talked talks about you can find it on youtube uh, but i thought that was really cool because i had no idea i thought this was just someone completely made this up but it actually does stem from some like and there's real like world, a comic like... book or something i think that yeah it, that, it's also that might have been where it originally derived as well um not 100 sure on that 
Um, so anyway, we talked about the first point. I don't think there's too much else yeah. to say about how they got rid of the the other alien subplot. And I guess they had to alter some of Frank the Pug's dialogue to kind of help alleviate that. Um, but talking about the ending scene, fun, fun fact, as I was uh, coming home, I was just in New York and came back to Boston today. Um, I was in Queens and I drove by on the highway this exact um, oh, nice. where the whole end sequence oh, that's happened. Cool. So from the highway, I could see, and I just watched the the night before too, I could see the globe and the two like UFO oh, things cool. that that's are cool. for the World's Fair. Yeah, so that was pretty cool to do that. Um, but anyway, the ending scene was reshot at the cost of $4.5 million. The original climax featured that was intended to be a comic Ex- uh, existential discussion between Jay and the bug. The director felt that his picture needed a wrap up that was more action oriented as he wanted to send the audience out with a bang. The cast and crew were gathered together to reshoot a new scene that depicted Kay getting swallowed by the bug while Jay fought to get his partner back out. That actually ties in with uh, what you mentioned, Keith, the, the, the fact that maybe the bug looked like the poorest thing. Yeah. Because it seems like it was an afterthought. Like, that was not supposed to be a thing. Yeah, maybe that's why the bug looks so different than every other uh, every yeah. other creature in that movie. Because they quickly threw him in at the at the end at the last so minute. So we were supposed to get, like, Edgar suit the entire movie, I guess? That's I guess interesting. so. That would have been a really just, just bad conclusion. Because even though the bug the bug ending honestly kind of lame still the fact that just k gets absorbed but then jay magically knows that he's gonna be back out and then he blows the body up it's it still wasn't a battle right there was no actual action other than jay getting thrown around so it's still interesting that 4.5 million but there wasn't a lot of action in the action scene no it, it almost sounds like the best possible scenario is a mix of the two because thinking about it if they did this uh did this scene of like the bug and will smith talking through this existential crisis and then when they're going through it in the middle of it and maybe will smith is getting to him uh jay or k just comes and shoots out of him and shoots out of his stomach that sounds like a pretty good scene to me kind of sad they didn't go that route yeah so next up for facts we have um, the fact that Men in Black uh, bucked the summer trend in a big way by continuing to maintain a strong presence outside of just having a big opening weekend. So it opened up with a, a $51 million opening weekend, um, but then it played well throughout the summer. In fact, it was in theaters for 21 weeks, never dropping out of the top 20. That's five months of theatrical play. That's impressive. It finally... Yeah, it finally closed at Thanksgiving of 97, ha- having accumulated a total domestic take of $250 million in nearly $590 million worldwide. I don't think that's adjusted for inflation either. No, so. in 97 bucks, that's a lot of money. Yeah. That is unreal. From the summer till November. Yeah, think till Thanksgiving. That. that is insane. We'll see if Endgame can do the same. Uh, I, I, yeah. I think people's expectations I, I include myself in that bunch I was like without question it's going to happen the moment that I saw the John Wick 3 actually quickly sort of went up there I realized oh so oddly enough like this huge conclusion to the to the MCU was good for like the first two weeks but it did kind of fizzle out yeah, yeah. It, I mean there's a lot of different factors I mean we have a lot more options for entertainment there's probably a lot more competition for movies So, you know, people have more things to do now than just go back to the theater. So I I, the world just moves at a faster pace these days that I don't think you'll ever see anything like that again. Yeah, it's very possible. Uh, Finally, the the last fun fact we got here. Uh, So the production studio originally wanted Clint Eastwood for the role of K. Oh, man. Uh, Whereas Jay was the funny one, K needed to be the exact opposite. The studio's idea for K was Hollywood luminary Clint Eastwood, an actor known for being straightforward, serious, and not all associated with movies containing any sort of fantasy element. Uh, Sonfeld, the director, I believe, uh, however, preferred Tommy Lee Jones. He told the Huffington Post that he knew Jones would be very intimidating. That's in part because, unlike Clint Eastwood, Jones is infamous for being slightly 
what is this word? Irascible in real life? He's so irascible, they, they had to go with the man. <laughs> I need to look up what that word means. Please do. Yeah, I, I have to yeah. agree with that point of Clint Eastwood almost feels like he would be too far in the direction of serious because with Tommy Lee Jones's character, it's mostly serious with a little bit of comedy thrown in. I don't know. He's like if, fun serious. Yeah, he's like, fun yeah. serious yeah. where Clint Eastwood is like super serious and maybe it just would have been a little too far. I think that was the right call. I feel Easily like with Clint, angered is what that yeah. word means, by the way. I feel way. like with Clint... Oh, it's what? Angered? Easily yeah, angered. easily angered. Oh, okay, okay. Seems like a much better way to go about that. I feel like with Clint Eastwood, it would have been more arguments between the characters, because if you notice, even you though they're problem, opposing boy. forces... Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you talking to me? He's like, um, yeah, <laughs> yes, actually, um, you're, you're my I teammate. Am, I am. Yeah. So, yeah. Wouldn't have been the worst option? But definitely not the best option. So thank you, Mr. McNulty, for leaving that that knowledge sauce all over our minds. I don't know why I chose that. Can you do some method acting in the knowledge sauce, please? <laughs> oh, that's what, dude. I went inside the cockroach, so like I was just slimed inside. It's too bad. Out. It's too bad we don't do weird show titles because I would totally title this one "Method Acting in the Knowledge Sauce." But <laughs> oh my oh goodness, well. that can that can be in the description of the the audio version. No, I context. think I'll just make that the description. <clears throat> Method acting in go. the knowledge sauce. Follow us on social media. Let's go with that. Let's go with All that. Right. But. Uh, before this continues to get worse, uh, if you like this podcast, if you like the the knowledge sauce we unleash upon you every week, every Sunday, you can leave a, a review on Apple Podcast. We're on Spotify. We're on pretty much everything. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid to follow us on social media. And if you'd like to check out some previous episodes, we got a couple of things. Most recently, we did a point five that I really enjoyed, uh, a shorter podcast episode, even though it's almost 40 minutes. But it was a digital versus physical media debate talking about video games. You know, Keith is somebody that preferred more of the digital route because it's oh, yeah. space saving, it's convenient, honestly, and I totally get that. But other people like myself, I like collecting video games, so I like having that. And then and Ryan was wrong. sort of in the middle of it. Yeah, it, nothing wrong with it. It's just a matter of people No, I'm have preferences. saying you're wrong. No, nothing wrong with it, man. <laughs> nothing wrong with it. You're uh, nothing wrong with it except you, but. Then we All have right. a review of Katamari Damacy. If you like to torture yourself, we talked about See No Evil. If you like to not torture yourself, we did The Old Face by reviewing Office Space. So, slime. Oh, 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 oh. Another exciting episode of a cast to the past. Oh, 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 oh.